Welcome back to CFO Weekly, where we're talking with financial leaders about how to build efficiency in their teams, create time for strategy, and ultimately get results with your host, Megan Weiss. Let's jump right in. Today, my guest is Charles Reed. Charles J. Reed is a certified public accountant, a U.S. tax court practitioner, a member of the Internal Revenue Service Advisory Council, and the founder of Get Payroll. Mr. Reed's companies have provided full service payroll services, payroll tax services, and other payroll related services since 1991. Charles is an accomplished senior executive and entrepreneur with more than 50 years of financial leadership experience in a broad range of industries and the author of four books with the most recent one being The Payroll Book, a guide for small businesses and startups. Hello, Charles, and thank you for joining me today. My pleasure, Megan. Yeah, today we'll be discussing the always important topic of payroll. Given that it's the main reason many of us come to work, it's not something you ever want to get wrong. But it's a complicated matter, and given ever-changing rules and regulations, ripe for error. I'm ready to learn a few things myself, so let's get started. First, Charles, tell me about your career progression. How did you get to where you are today? Well, after high school, I went in the military. I spent four years in the United States Marine Corps, two years overseas, including a trip to uh, Vietnam as a combat infantryman. I was trained as a computer programmer, however. After college, after military, where I'd gotten married and and, uh, I met my wife and married her and she had five kids when I married her. So I just claim insanity. Uh, (laughs) I realized that uh, at that point in time, and still today, a lot of employers don't recognize the quality of military experience and what it brings to the table, which is a, a terrible mistake. It definitely- so I went, I went and got my degrees instead. I went and got my bachelor's and my master's, got interested in accounting while I was in school, sat for and passed my CPA exam while I was still in graduate school, went to work for major corporations and then smaller ones. And here, 30 years ago, I got tired of corporate life because I knew I was never going to get to the top of a major corporation. I didn't have the political skills. I was unwilling to stab people in the back and throw them off the ladder. So if I was going to run a business as my father had his own business, I'd have to start my own. So 30 years ago, my wife and I started my own business, our own business. And uh, it was a uh, accounting and payroll company doing mobile accounting, which we no longer do. Technology has changed. And I sold off the accounting about 10 years ago to my partner and uh, stayed with payroll, which I love. It's fun. It's exciting. It's changing. It's business to business. And I get to deal with the IRS on a daily basis. <laughs> That's, I'm not sure that sounds like much fun. Well, for a competitive type individual, it is fun. It's a game. And once you get good at it, I solve clients' problems all the time because I'm I'm now a compliance expert. I've been in the field for 30 years, studied it, became a U.S. tax court practitioner so I can go to U.S. tax court for my clients, even though I'm not an attorney. There's a couple hundred of us of those in the country. And then I spent the last three years on ERSAC, which is the IRS Advisory Council, dealing with the IRS on IRS problems and situations, got to know all the major players and a lot more information. And so, you know, it's fun to me. I know it's not fun to everybody, but dealing with the IRS is is, is a fun challenge and it's something I'm very successful at. So yeah, it I works. Guess, I guess when you're doing it daily, you get very good at it. You either get good at it or you go broke (laughs) or your clients go broke. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, I find myself saying this so often to my guests, but I'm always so impressed with how many different roads you can take when with a finance and accounting degree. I find new ways to make a living in this country literally every day. And with an MBA and a CPA, they think you know everything about business and everything about accounting and everything about taxes, whether you do or not, they think you do. So it opens up a lot of doors. So yeah, I was able to do a lot of different things in a lot of different industries and got a lot of experience in the last 50 years. (laughs) 
So throughout that experience, are there any particular stories or moves that stand out in your mind as turning points? Um, one of them in, in accounting was I was a senior in college and it is a spring day, it's bright and sunny. I'm on the third floor of the University of North Texas business building, walking between classes. And at that point in time, I finally understood depreciation. <laughs> I mean, I, I could work it on paper, but I didn't understand it, it didn't feel it. And as I'm walking a class, between classes thinking about it, all of a sudden it all came clear to me. And that's when I became an accountant. <laughs> yeah, I think I it does, that's it clicks. A... It clicks for some people, not for most, it, but for some. It just clicked. And at that point in time, I knew I was gonna become an accountant. I, I, that's a terrible thing, I guess, for some people, but it did and I've, I've enjoyed that, the, the career path ever since. Obviously getting married, my wife had five kids, of course, when I married her, and uh, that changed my life. And then starting my own business, that's a major undertaking. And, and for those who, who are contemplating doing it, there is no work-life balance for an entrepreneur, okay? <laughs> it's work. Uh, and Ruth and I started the business together. And if your spouse understands that, it makes your life a lot easier because yeah. it's 80 hours a week for the first, for me, it was 20 years before I could really take a vacation. So we, we got through it and we, we managed and we have a good living out of it. Uh, Ruth's passed a few years ago, six years ago, actually. But we had 45 years of marriage, good marriage, not perfect, but good. So those are some of the things that, that you know, and, and then getting into getting my USTCP so I can represent clients in court. That, that's major. That was fun. And I'm getting that in my 60s and still getting education. Never quit learning. Yeah. You, you, if, if you quit learning, you, you know, you're done. Yeah. 100% <laughs> agree with that. Particularly in this industry, because it changes all the time. I think the only industry I think of that is worth for changes is probably financial planning. Because that market changes moment to moment. Yeah, that's very true. <laughs> And I've done that. And I, I gave it up because I couldn't do that in taxes both. So. So tell me about your business. What do you do for your clients? Well, we're a full service payroll company, which means we provide payroll and payroll associated services, timekeeping, HR. We have workers comp partners. We have health insurance partners. Uh, we have retirement partners that we work with with our clients that we vet it out and we trust. Because I'm not a licensed insurance agent, but I have people that are that can work with my clients for them. So we handle all the payroll and payroll related products for our clients to solve their 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 problems. We do all states in the District of Columbia, but our real unique selling proposition, for lack of a better word, is we're compliance experts. We're insurance for our, our, our clients' payroll. You may never need some of the skill set that we've honed very, very much over the last 30 years. But if you need it, there's only a few places in the country you can find it, and we're one of them. And since we provide that at no additional cost, it's a hell of a deal. I mean, if you've got a problem with the IRS, you can go out and hire a tax attorney, pluck down $5,000 for a retainer, and God knows what his fee is going to be. If it's an employment tax-related problem and we're your payroll company, uh, we solve it, whatever it takes. I had one where they were trying to penalize a client and it got up to $95,000. It took nine years. Wow. And finally, I called the deputy chief of appeals, who I'd met, and said, Kathy, I can't get this guy, who's the next guy in the appeals level, to call my call me back after a year. And she said, Charles, uh, I'll take care of that. He called me that afternoon. We got the case re-looked at by new eyes. And the $95,000 penalty was abated in full, along with all the interest, and our client got a $400 refund. Wow, that's quite a swing. It took nine years. 
Yeah, well, it sounds like you have a great value proposition going on. We think so. And our, I think our clients think so too, because our, our retention is just incredible. Sure, we lose clients that die, that sell out, and they get to go bankrupt, but we don't have very many that are switching to other payroll companies. So is there like a specific size business you focus on? What clients yeah, do you take well, on? Yes and no. They have to have one. Okay. And it may be themselves. We have people who've incorporated. And of course, once you've incorporated and you work in the corporation, you have to take W-2 compensation. So we have, we have some of those. And then we have companies up into the multiple hundreds of employees. Now, once you hit about 500 employees, there becomes some rationale for bringing it in-house because of the cost and, and the, the complexity. Because the more people you add, there's always exceptions, always exceptions, always exceptions. And the more people you have, the more exceptions there are. Yeah. So we don't have anybody over 500 people at the moment. We could. We can handle that. We have them running into the, you know, two, 300 people. But we just have people everywhere, clients everywhere. So we enjoy them. And how have you seen payroll change over the last decade? Oh, wow. <laughs> the last... 12 years, particularly, starting with uh, when Barack Obama came into office. The previous four years were, were relatively stable, but there were a lot of changes because of the recession. Uh, there was the, the uh, FICA holiday for a year. They never fixed the forms to that. Some of the forms were never fixed. And if you had to do a 1040X on that year, you can change the form because the IRS never got around to changing it. So the laws have changed. The courts have continued to do things. We have the, the blow up of the gig economy, which has caused all kinds of dislocations. California has made a roller coaster out of that whole concept with their, uh, their House Bill 5 or whatever, Senate Bill 5, which was going to make them employees, and then the referendum to make them independent contractors, and the federal government stepping into it. There were new labor laws, literally, that were written last year on independent contractors that have now been, some have been rescinded, and some are in the process of being rescinded by the new administration. The COVID thing with the FFRCA and the PPP, and then we're just talking laws, let alone technology. A dozen years ago, we probably did 80% in checks. We probably don't do 5% of our payments for our clients in checks now. It's all direct deposit or debit cards. There's no reason to issue checks. So technology has changed. You know, a dozen years ago, fax machines were a big thing on sending in payrolls. I don't think any of my clients fax in the payroll information anymore. It's all done either on the net or uh, scan and, and, and email. Uh, it's just <laughs> fax machines. I still have a couple of them because the IRS, sometimes that's the only way you can get things to the IRS is via fax. So computers have changed. We actually do more payroll with less people than we did a dozen years ago by yeah. far. Technology has been life-changing for sure in the last decade. <laughs> oh, it's just been absolutely incredible. Breathtaking. So what are the emerging trends you're seeing? What what can what do you think the future holds for payroll? Tax changes, first of all. We know those are happening. The Labor Department's changing things already. The Biden administration is proposing a number of things. The progressive wing of the Democratic Party is proposing lots of other things. And uh, the increased child credit, the expansion of the second PPP, uh, the expansion of tax credits, all these things. And a lot of people don't realize 70% of federal revenue runs through payroll. Wow. I had exactly. no idea. 70% <laughs> of all government, federal government revenue runs through the payroll department, withholding withholding taxes, employment taxes, FICA, Medicare, all that stuff all runs through payroll. So when they want to change things, they change the payroll rules. 
Now, not only are they changing the tax rules, but they change the forms. There's a new W-4 last year that still isn't, in my personal opinion, uh, very successful. It's a major change, and it was a compromise, and I don't think it was a good compromise. 1099-NEC is back in this year, okay, uh, in, in taking out the non-employee off of the 1099 miss. So lots of changes going on constantly. And unemployment taxes, New Hampshire minimum unemployment tax rose 500%. Texas will not announce their tax rate until June. Wow. For unemployment taxes. And, but you're having to pay it now. Okay. <laughs> but what do you pay? You don't know. So you, you either use the default rate or last year's rate, but you know it's going to go up. Now, a lot of people had to lay off a lot of people. That's probably going to get socialized where everybody gets hit, which is, is that fair? I don't know. But instead of, instead of well, you laid off 50 people, so your unemployment rate's going to go through the roof. We're just going to say, everybody's going to pay more. So the people that kept all their employees through this uh, shutdown, they're going to pay the price for unemployment as well as the people who laid people off. Not sure and, that's and fair. It, it, I don't think it's fair either, but I don't, I, you know, yeah. uh, you know, I, I, I send notes to my state representatives and, and my governor about that. And then of course, food attacks, Credit's going to come back in for at least 20 states and probably more like 30 or 35, where the food rate's going to go up to, you know, California has has borrowed hundreds of billions of dollars of unemployment money that all has to be paid from the federal government. That all has to be paid back off the employers in California. So the shutdown is is going to increase their taxes as well as ruin their businesses. We're going to be fighting COVID related matters for several years. And then the proposals for the Democrats for child credits and the idea that they're going to get, and this is going to go back to uh, advanced earned income credit, the whole thing where they want uh, the child care credit of $300 a month to be every month. Well, they're not going to insist that the Treasury Department send out checks they're going to insist that employers uh, put it on their paychecks and then get a credit against their 941. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> then who's going to be responsible for the fraud? The employer, the federal government, the employee? You know, it, it gets crazy. <laughs> Sounds so complicated. That's why anybody who does their own payroll and is not an, an expert like we are, really needs to think twice about it. Doing it in-house, we have a staff that keeps up on these changes, okay? <laughs> and, and reads the dailies, and I get five newsletters from the IRS every week, okay? <laughs> and I read them all. So it is a extremely complex topic, and it's getting more complex literally every day. So what should CFOs be thinking about when it comes to payroll? Well, there's a, there's a lot of things that they need to look at. Um, there's a lot of fraud in payroll. There's ghost employees that they need to be sure about. If they're not solid on their timekeeping, a company without a timekeeping system is estimated to lose 10% of their payroll is wasted. Classification. Is everybody classified properly? The Labor Department estimates that 70% of US businesses misclassify employees, either as independent contractors versus employees or exempt or non-exempt. And you know, that sounds simple, but it isn't. And it really in the end comes down to what the judge says, because if you disagree and you fight it, your final decision may be in a, in a, in a court case, either state or federal. And you're never guaranteed a winning. Uh, you know, you, you avoid court when possible. So those are major things. Disaster recovery. A lot of us learned this with Katrina, which is one of the push for direct deposit over the years. What do you do if there's a disaster, either externally or internally, and make sure your people can get paid? You know, the computer room may flood or burn. The hurricane, the tornado, 
the shutdowns. What happens when the government says your people can't come to work to process payroll, but yet you got to pay them or they're working from home. The whole working from home thing, how do you track the hours? How do you track your productivity? How do you track these people to make sure you're getting what you're paying for? Pay rates, is everybody being paid the right rate? Are all the rules being followed? I got called in for a bank one time, a nice size regional bank to revamp their payroll system. And after about a week, the head of payroll got me my contract terminated because they were following a set of rules for overtime, which were not the law, but managed to pay most of the people in the bank a few hours of overtime unnecessarily every week, including the head of the payroll department. And wow. when I said, this isn't right, uh, she went to her boss and they dismissed me. <laughs> so, you know, internally, you got to, <laughs> if you're the CFO, you've got to look at some of these things. Sometimes, yeah, you, you hire good people and, and you work with them and you trust them, but, you know, trust but verify. Yeah. Payroll uh, is cheap. already such a huge expense for companies. It can be, in many cases, their largest expense, not mm -hmm. all. I mean, some it's materials and other things, but payroll can be a huge expense for them. And they need to be on top of every aspect of it, or at least periodically go in and audit, check, cross-check, bring in an outsider and look at it. And outsourcing payroll, if you can do it, is a great way to add some controls because we're not going to write ourselves paychecks as a payroll company. We're not going to inflate those checks. And the chances of collusion between your employee and our employee with you overlooking them and us, me overlooking ours, is reduces the chance. So all that kind of thing works. All those internal controls on payroll, knowing who you're hiring, know who you're paying, know you're paying the right amount, know when you're paying them, all these things are, are, are critical to the CFO, that those in internal controls. There's other things, record retention. Every federal agency has different rules. I tell my clients, the best thing to do is keep everything forever. I know that sounds ridiculous, but I've had IRS um, criminal investigators come in and want to see 10 years of records. And we had them for our client and our client won the case. So there's times that it's going to sound ridiculous, but there's in different organizations, if you can't keep them forever, some want three years, some want five years, they want different things. The labor department wants one set, and the IRS wants another set. Various different laws require different retention for and what they want retained and how long they want it retained. One that many people, and uh, I had a major client, that fell into this, I asked her one day, well, you know, did she file her as cheat for this year? And she said, what? I said, it's cheat. She said, what? <laughs> I said, well, they were in a major imaging center and they had lots of insurance claims and they ended up getting overpaid, you know, on deductibles and so on. So they had thousands of checks every year going out to their patients. And a lot of them never got cashed. People died, moved, whatever. I said, oh, you've got to send all that money to the uh, state of Texas. She said, what? I said, Joanne, that's not your money. You don't just get to leave in your bank account. She said, why not? And I said, because as cheat laws in every state, unclaimed property and, and uncashed checks or unclaimed property have to be sent to the state. That's where all those unclaimed property ads come from and websites and in the newspaper once a year, they list everybody. She says, oh, is that what that is? I said, yeah. So we got the lawyer and we talked to the state and they agreed if we'd give them the last three years, they'd forego the previous 20. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a good trade-off in that case. It was, and, and of course, the promise that we would keep it up. And of course, that got on the, the um, state comptroller's audit list for that particular client, check on this sheet for this client every year. <laughs> so, and the CFO 
needs to look at the handbook. He needs to make sure that all those financial functions that affect employees are covered correctly in the employee handbook. It's so important because a case that goes back a number of years, a gentleman had declined his group health coverage and because it was too expensive for him. And then his wife had a child with some substantial problems. And his lawyer sued the company to have the insurance company pay for it. The insurance company said, oh, he's not covered. And the company said, well, he didn't sign up. And the lawyer said, prove it. And it cost the company several million dollars over 20 years to take care of that child because they couldn't prove that he had specifically declined that coverage. So, yeah, that's part of HR, but it ended up costing that company millions of dollars in cash because nobody had set up those procedures to make sure those things happen. So the CFO needs to review some of this stuff classifications, termination. Uh, does, he want, does he want to write the check for the discrimination lawsuit because HR wasn't paying attention? So these are money things that the CFO needs to be concerned with. So he needs to review that handbook along with his attorney. <laughs> so these are just some of the things. And, you know, we go through a lot of that in my new book and go through all these things. Uh, it was published by Wiley last year. It's the payroll book. It's available on Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, other places, or the payrollbook.com, which is our website for it. Oh, another one that CFO needs to be extremely aware of are all his employees legal. I mean, there's what, 30 million undocumented workers in the country. And if you have them, it can be very expensive. People go to jail over it. He needs to be aware of that and make sure that uh, all that's in place so um, management's not going to jail. Believe me, the CEO is not going to be happy if he's going to jail because mm -hmm. there's illegal aliens on the payroll. So there's can a, a whole bunch CFO of CFO that's outsourced payroll wash their hands of these concerns, or do many of them not go away? Some of them don't go away. I mean, you know, we produce payroll for the companies. If those checks don't get cashed, we're not reconciling them. Yeah. Okay. So we don't know. We don't, we have companies that write handbooks for our clients that then have some fiduciary and li uh, liability for those handbooks. When HR sends in a new person, we don't know if they're classified correctly. If, if the company says this is employee, we treat them as employee. They say they're an independent contractor, we treat them as an independent contractor. We don't go out and sit down and go through the paperwork for that employee and say, oh, wait a minute. Now, if our client asks, we'll go, hey, what's the paperwork say? What's the situation? What are they doing? What's the job? And all those other things that you have to go through because we've done it thousands and thousands of times, okay? If we're not providing the timekeeping, and even if we are, we don't know if it's being properly used. One of my clients had a time clock. And I, I told her, said, you know, you really need to think about a biometric clock. And she laughed. She said, no, no, we employ professionals. You know, this was a, a, a medical operation. We don't need to worry about that. And I said, let's do this. Let's put a camera on the time clock and not tell anybody. Then you can check that and see what's happening. At the end of a week, she fired three employees and ordered a biometric clock to prevent buddy punching because the clock was not supervised. It was in a back corridor near the entrance and people were buddy punching in their friends. I can't solve that problem. I can recommend a biometric clock that will. So, yeah, but what we do by outsourcing payroll is you don't have to worry about the tax problems. You don't have to worry about the payroll being calculated. You don't have to worry about deposits. You don't have to worry about reports. You don't have to worry about IRS mistakes because we'll fix them. We'll deal with the states. We'll fix those problems. We'll make sure everything's filed on time. Everything's filed properly. 
And when you have questions, we've got experts. If you want to hire your own expert, payroll expert, you're going to spend well into six figures and probably not get the expertise we have on hand here. And we're always available. Plus, we have the software and the hardware and the facilities to do all the payroll processing. So when the law changes, you don't have to worry about it. We do. When the payroll computer gets overloaded or slows down or gets blown away by a tornado, believe me, we have hot site completely available. If this building is destroyed in a tornado tonight, we will be in operation by 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Complete operation. So all those things that you would worry about from the payroll side, uh, taxes, filings, the money side of it, the movement of money, ACH, bank accounts, all that kind of, we work with that. That's our specialty. And then the compliance. You don't, IRS calls, you just tell them to call us. They send you a letter, send it to us. In fact, we'll take a 2848 and we'll get a copy of it anyway. We're probably working on it. And in many cases, the client calls and says, oh, I got this letter and we can send them a copy of what we've already filed to correct it. So we don't solve everything, but we solve a lot of the problems. Yeah, definitely sounds like it. You touched on this, so I'll just jump to it. But um, for those companies that do have hourly workforce, from what you just said, it sounds like time clocks might not be the best way to track hours. Oh, no. You know, the old manual time clock you see in the old movies, you know, where they have the, the, the rack and you pull the card out and you punch it in and you put it back in the rack. I worked for Colgate Palmolive making soap when I got out of the military before I started in school in an old soap factory. Uh, I was a member of the All Chemical and Atomic Workers of America. And they had an old time clock just like that. But the supervisor unlocked it. Everybody punched in and then the supervisor locked it back up. And if you had to leave early, you had to get the supervisor and he had to unlock the clock so you could punch out. Then the, the clerical people took and manually added and subtracted all of those punches, which leads to errors, and then transmitted that information to the payroll system. With an electronic system, the punches in and out, the time is automatically calculated. Nobody has to go in and manually calculate it. So electronic makes it that much easier, but it still has to be either supervised or controlled in a different way. Biometric is a great way to control it, either hand or fingerprint or something of that order, or at a minimum, individualized cards, or in some cases, passwords. But cards and passwords can be shared. The shape of your hand or your fingerprint can't really be shared, or your retinal scan or other things. So biometric, which is not that much more expensive, does a lot of that. Then for people with a lot of people on the road, you have geofencing, where when they come into with 100 yards of the right spot, uh, their phone connects with the payroll computer and logs them in and logs them out. So there's a lot of technology changes from that old punch clock that are available that make all the sense in the world for a CFO to investigate. Because again, if you don't have a, a, a good time clock system, as much as 10% of your payroll is wasted. And buddy punching and ghost employees are a constant problem. I had a client, um, he was on the West Coast and he had several operations and he signed his own checks. I thought it was kind of a waste of time, but one day he called me and said, Charles, I've got a check here for so-and-so. And I said, okay, let me look. And I pulled him, I said, yeah, 40 hours and whatever and so on. He said, I fired him six weeks ago. I said, hold on. And I pulled up the input sheet and I said, well, your young lady here in Dallas sent me this sheet and has him on there with 40 hours of work. He said, can you fax that to me? I said, sure. She got fired that afternoon. <laughs> so there's all kinds of problems. Oh, people always out there trying to scam the system. Absolutely. Absolutely. She was in collusion with the guy that had been fired. She kept giving him his check, and I'm sure she got her cut. Yeah. 
Maybe they were in a relationship together. Who knows? Who knows? So let's talk about something that I'd never heard of before, um, and that's on-demand pay. What is this, Uh, and how is it complicating payroll? Okay, on-demand pay. I did up a whole brief for the IRS commissioner last year on on on-demand pay, or year before. On-demand pay, and it's been pioneered by some of the rideshare companies. Uh, If you're an Uber driver, you can get paid five times a day. Wow. Literally, you just go in and, and, and take your money out and it gets transferred to your bank account. That's crazy. It is. There's a whole lot of problems with administering it. What happens over the end of the year? When is it taxable? When is it not taxable? What if you overpay them? They said they worked so many hours and you pay them, and then it turns out they didn't, so you want to dock their pay and they're not there. Is that now a gift to them? It's obviously theft. So how do you account for that? And the, the paperwork of dealing with paying people daily or three times per pay period or four times a week or on demand, it just multiplies the paperwork. Now, there are companies that are pushing that. And I'll tell you why they're pushing that. Because they get paid every time your employee gets paid. So they want him to get paid five times a day because they take a fee every time he gets paid. So you're upping your costs. And the major corporations that are doing this, Ceridian's a big one pushing it, is that, well, it's a way to enhance getting employees and attracting employees. I disagree. And the paperwork and the problems, it's going to lay on the payroll and accounting departments and on the CFO is almost unbelievable. You know, you think it's bad enough to pay 100 employees every two weeks. What if you're paying 100 employees twice a day? And tax deposits. When you hit certain levels, you've got to make that tax deposit. Well, that may happen on odd days. You know, as long as you're doing on a payroll, you know, okay, that payday is that amount of taxes due. I know when I have to pay it. I either have to pay it the next day, or I have to pay it the next Wednesday, or I have to pay it the 15th of next month. I know. With demand pay, you're going to miss them. You're not going to know. You're going to have to track all that. It's a mess. I don't recommend it for anybody. I don't think it's going to last. I think most corporations and most businesses are going to say, no. (laughs) And the companies that are pushing it, that service will dry up at some point in time because there won't be enough people taking it. And I may be wrong. It may become, you know, uh, you go to the grocery store and you you, you pay with your payroll. You don't pay with your bank account. I don't know. I don't expect that, but that's demand pay. And the IRS, the, the people that are setting the rules now are the vendors. The IRS has not issued any guidance. And I gave them a whole series of questions that they need to provide guidance on to the business owner, to the CFO, and they have not yet done it. It's in the process. But with COVID, oh. <laughs> you know, when they got to uh, some 20 million pieces of unopened mail, they had the, that was the IRS. They had other problems. When I talked to uh, Sunita Lowe late last year, she's the deputy commissioner. She works for Chuck Reddick. They still had over 3 million pieces of unopened mail. I I can't even imagine how much this last year has complicated everything. And here's what's from a taxpayer's point of view. All these people that refused to come in and open mail for the IRS and stayed home because of COVID got paid in full with tax dollars. Don't even get me started. Yeah. (laughs) I want a job like that. Please, please. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that makes my blood boil. Yeah. So with the gig economy in full swing, how should we be looking at independent contractors? (sighs) Okay. The law is in flux. You have the, the standard 20 common law rules, which is still the base most courts look at. Okay. Then you have ABC in California, 
which they insist on. There's some people in the federal government that want to make that test the test for independent contractor versus employee. So you have to be aware of the changes in the federal rules. New rules went into effect the 8th of March, but they are in flux. They may be rescinded. The economic reality rule, which the Labor Department was trying to put into place, has now been thrown out by several courts. So I wish I could advise you other than to stay on top of it. We advise our clients quite often on it as the rules change because we stay on top of them. But what's going to happen next week, next month, later in the year, I don't have any idea. Obviously, there's some facets of of people that would prefer that everybody be an employee. The government would prefer that because then taxes are withheld and submitted and compliance for tax purposes goes way up. If taxes are withheld and deposited and reported, then compliance is about 99%. If taxes aren't withheld or reported, as in many cases in small gig economy, compliance is 27%. So if you've got small gig workers that aren't getting 1099Ks or 1099 NECs, compliance rate's minimal. Once they're on 1099s, compliance rate goes up, but it still doesn't equal W-2, okay? And it's not withheld, so it goes to the government next year when taxes are paid, okay? So the government would rather have it all and have it today. Then there's the gig companies, you know, Uber and, and, and Lyft being some of the primary ones that don't want the government in their business and don't want to withhold taxes, don't want to report them, don't want to pay them. They don't think they should have to. So the unions would prefer everybody on payroll. So you have competing interests that are fighting it out with lobbyists and pressure on congressional representatives and state representatives and state legislatures. Uber and Lyft spent, what, $200 million getting that referendum through that made Uber and Lyft drivers independent contractors, which was a direct reversal of the law that the state legislature had passed in California. You think the state legislature is going to sit still for that? I don't. So it's a war out there at the moment. (laughs) So the only thing I can advise CFOs is to stay on top of it. And uh, if you've got a choice, make them employees. They don't have to worry about it. Because if you make them gig con- if you make them independent contractors and the IRS determines in the course determine they're supposed to be employees, then you've got tax problems because they're going to want all of those back taxes from you. Then you have to try and go collect them from the employee that, that you didn't take them from. And then there's interest and in penalties. And uh, I watched one client in California almost lose his business over classification problem. Because the state of California came in, said, no, these people are employees and you owe all this money for the last number of years. And it was a total mess. So employee is is the safe side. And in reality for you as a business, as a CFO, there shouldn't be a whole lot of difference between paying an independent contractor and paying an employee. Now, you're not paying his share of the FICA taxes. He should be, but you should be compensating him for that. So the the difference in in total compensation should not be that much. The difference is in who pays it and when it's paid. And therein lies the problem because independent contractors don't pay the taxes. So if our listeners only remember one thing from the conversation we've had today, what would you like it to be? Consider outsourcing payroll if you're not because... Why are you wasting your time doing things that you have experts willing to do for a pittance? It's not worth your time, my friend. Yep. It's not worth the effort. Outsource it and outsource it to a company. Well, you should outsource it to us, of course, but outsource it to a company that can give you what you need, that have professionals on staff that'll talk to you. Our major competitors our our big national competitors, if you call them and say, I need to talk to a CPA about a tax problem, 
they'll tell you to talk to your own CPA. Well, if your own CPA really understood payroll, he'd be doing it. So uh, they're producing checks and and they do a good job at it. I'm, I'm not gonna bash any of the majors. They do a very good job at producing checks and direct deposits. But when the IRS screws up and the IRS makes millions of mistakes a year, you're basically on your own. Yeah, I'm a big fan of outsourcing. It's my industry as well. So I, I say focus on your core competencies and outsource the rest. Yeah, I mean, I, mean I, don't, I don't make widgets. I don't serve barbecue. I don't groom dogs. I don't install windows. I don't build whatever. I don't build houses. You know, I don't bake bread. I don't make my own clothes. I don't make my own car. I don't build my own building. I don't build my own computers. The only reason I do my own payroll is because that's my core competency. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Charles, thank you so much for joining me today. Megan, been my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I've enjoyed speaking with you and hearing your advice on how we can do a better job of managing our payroll and avoiding some of the common pitfalls along the way. To all of our listeners, I hope you've enjoyed this episode as well. Please tune in next week. And until then, take care of yourselves. If you're ready to boost efficiency and streamline your accounting processes at significant cost savings, it's time to talk with Personiv. Their people-powered solutions have transformed the delivery of back office tasks and general accounting functions for decades, partnering with clients to provide everything from accounts payable to payroll services. See what Personiv can do for you by visiting personiv.com. You've been listening to CFO Weekly presented by Personiv. Please subscribe wherever you get your podcasts to hear all of our episodes. Want to learn more? Check out personive.com. Thanks for listening.